Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm Tom Concolino, and I'm here with our presenters, Angela Criswell and Aya Takase. Hey, Thank you all for attending Vergaku's webinar series on X-ray computed tomography for materials and life science. Uh, this session is on image processing using Dragonfly. Uh, this will be taking place in the office with Angela and I reviewing in real time how to process images using Dragonfly. Now, please note that if you missed any of the previous webinars, you can view them on the Ragaku website. We also want to welcome Dr. Mike Marsh, the Dragonfly product manager from Object Research Systems as a guest panelist. So he'll be able to answer to add additional thoughts and answer some questions throughout the session as well. Uh, but before we start, a few housekeeping items. As far as today goes, uh, this is going to be an interactive session. So we'll be taking your questions live during the webcast, but we'll be answering them during the session. So please don't wait until the end to ask. And as usual, please submit those questions via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Now I won't be monitoring the raised hand function and I'll be posting relevant links in the chat window. We'll be trying to answer as many questions as we can during the session and we'll respond to any unanswered questions after the session is complete. Okay, so if for whatever reason you have difficulty viewing the webinar live, please note that it is being recorded and you will be able to view the recording beginning tomorrow. And with that said, I'll turn it over to Angela and Aya. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Tom. Thanks, Aya. Especially thanks to Mike Marsh and to all of you that are joining us today for this presentation. And as Tom mentioned, we're presenting live from our office here in the Woodlands. And uh, today I'll be referring a lot to some earlier workshops that we did because this is in fact the fourth and final workshop in a four workshop series that included first two sessions on image processing using ImageJ, followed by one session on reconstruction. And then today for the last session, we'll switch gears and talk about image processing using Dragonfly, which is a commercial uh, program. Now, if you missed any of these previous workshops, don't worry, they're on our website. And I'm sure Tom is going to include a link to those for you to watch. <clears throat> so with that said, the things that we're going to cover today are we're again going to ask that age old question, why, why do we even do this? Why are we processing these images? And if you've watched uh, our web, our, our workshop series, you should know the answer to this one for sure. So um, the second thing we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the image processing filters that are available within the Dragonfly package. And then we'll wrap up by looking at a few examples of these, not all of them, a few of them, uh, using the program interactively. And I just wanna quickly uh, describe the package that we'll be using today. So we'll be using a Dragonfly that's provided by Object Research Systems. Specifically, we're gonna be using version 2022.1. And this package is one that I and I use a lot in the lab um, and because it has lots of benefits. So this particular package, of course, is much faster than ImageJ. We could never use ImageJ to process our full stacks of data that we're collecting on a regular basis. And in many cases, uh, the program uses GPU to do calculations. Now we do everything locally on our machine, but there is available cloud computing and storage. So if you don't have a high power PC in your lab, you can certainly take advantage of this that they offer. Um, they have some excellent features, some of which I'll show you today. One of them is a really great segmentation wizard. So it gets you going uh, pretty quickly if you're gonna go to machine learning or deep learning, for example. And it's under constant development. So we're getting updates periodically and we have great feedback with the program authors and those supporting it. And one of the most powerful things, I wanna give a thumbs up to Mike Marsh is that right after the pandemic started, he uh, he started doing these uh, sessions, these daily sessions are called Dragonfly Dailies. 
Uh, there's about 40 of these videos on YouTube and they literally start from the point, how do I install the software? And then they go all the way to advanced techniques like deep learning and other stuff. So, um, so that, that's why we use it. Of course, we're a commercial user. It's free to, for non-commercial use. Uh, and if you've not used it before, I would encourage you to go check it out. You can get a 30 day free license even if you happen to be a commercial user. All right, <clears throat> so let's go on to get started today. And uh, we're gonna ask the question, so why are we processing images? And this is gonna lead us to our first poll question. Okay, so let me start the question. So as Angela said, the first question we're asking you is, why do we need to perform image processing? And here are the choices. A, to make CT images look more attractive for publication. B, to help with the CT image segmentation. C, to remove artifacts from CT images. Or B and C, or all of the above. It's kind of split a half and a half between two choices. I'm gonna give you a few more seconds to think about it and see. Okay, so most of you made your choice. So I'm gonna end the poll and share the results. It's actually more split than I thought. There you it's go. It's quite split. Wow, right okay, BNC yeah. BNC or all of the above. <laughs> Well, I would, uh, about 48% of you got the correct answer and the correct answer is B and C. Why do I say that? Well, it's not all of the above because when we put our images out for publication, we're not gonna modify them. We might make a pretty cover article or something like that with our data. But in fact, for publication, we don't wanna supply modified data. That'll get you in, in some trouble. So, um, so that's the answer to that one. So then, and, and so now that you know that, you, you should also know that if we wanna analyze these data and we wanna quantify them, uh, as we've mentioned in previous workshops, we first have to segment the images. And then during that step, what we're doing is we're labeling uh, voxels within the image and assigning them to a specific region of interest for, for each phase. And there's lots of tools for doing this. Uh, and we've mentioned a few of those uh, in our previous workshops. So, um, but with the, and then uh, you can actually do a lot of those things in Dragonfly. All right, <clears throat> so just to reiterate that, I wanna show you here an original image of foam. And now this particular sample has two phases. If you've been in our workshops or webinars, you'll see this a lot. So there's a polymer phase there's an error or void phase. And the data are a bit noisy. And if we attempted to just segment these uh, images using just simple thresholding, then we're gonna get incorrect identification or a classification of, of some of these voxels. So for example, some of those in polymer area are mislabeled as void and some of those in the void area are mislabeled as polymer uh, in meaning that they're red. So, what we're doing here is uh, we're gonna process the images because if we in fact denoise the data and then run our simple thresholding again, then we see we get much better uh, segmentation. So the idea here is to take that segmentation step from one that could take days to one that could happen as quickly as hours or minutes. And Ideally, we would want to have data without any noise at all, but that's not always the case and you have to deal with what you have. So we're gonna show you some tools uh, how to reduce the noise using Dragonfly. But if in fact you're interested in learning strategies about collecting the best denoise or noise-free data, you can check out a blog article that my colleague Aya wrote and Tom can give you a link. It gives you some good strategies for data collection. All right, so first I'm gonna recap some information from our first two workshops. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail, but I wanna briefly summarize what we've covered. So recall from that first imaging processing workshop, I described how denoising filters work using this generic 
equation that's shown here. And in our case, our original image is here. It's fx of y, where this is the gray, the gray value at a given xy position, and hmn is the filter that we plan to use. And if you run this filter, then you get the result gx of y, which is our output image where the pixel intensities are most likely modified. And these filters, they can come in a variety of functions and mathematical operations. And some of them are simple. They're just deep convolution matrices, or they perform some arithmetic of local pixel intensities. But there's some more complicated and elaborate ones. And sometimes you combine multiple operations or filters to get the desired effect for your image. <clears throat> So now that we know that we're going to use filters and why we use them, which ones are available for use in Dragonfly? So this is a comprehensive list of the different classes of image processing operation. And within each class, there are multiple sub-operations. So what I want to show you is that this is a very feature-rich imaging processing uh, package <clears throat> that you have lots of tools. And that's actually one of the advantages of Dragonfly and many commercial packages. So we're not going to have time to talk about each of these, but instead we're going to cover a few and compare them basically to the image J work that we did. So specifically, the operations that we're going to cover smoothing, really denoising, um, sharpening, we're going to look at editable ones, morphology operations, and we'll wrap up with artifact removal. So, and before I move on, we're going to do a short recap of each of these five classes that are shown here. So the smoothing or denoising one, let's talk uh, about that. So I have showed you uh, some filters uh, in the previous workshop. Um, one of those that uses a three by three matrix of pixels or a kernel where the center value is higher than that of the outside value. And that was a weighted average filter. We also looked at um, Gaussian filters and there were a couple of parameters, the sigma uh, parameter that you could choose that would influence uh, how much the smoothing occurred. Uh, we also looked at the median filter, which considers each pixel in, in the image in turn and replace it with the replaces the value with the median of the pixels intensities nearby. Uh, and of course, all of these are available in Dragonfly as well as others, and we'll look at those. There's also another useful filter that I like in Dragonfly. It's called the total variation filter. So um, <clears throat> Dragonfly offers a couple of these filters, and they work on the premise that signals with excessive spurious detail, in other words, noise, they have high total variation in pixel intensity. And the premise is this, if you dampen or reduce the variation of uh, these pixel intenses, you will reduce the noise or denoise the image. So fundamentally, the total variation filters work by minimizing the variation of pixel intensity uh, across the image and between adjacent pixels. And they're awfully good also at re maintaining the edges. And an important parameter for the total variation filter uh, is the weighting parameter. And it's often called uh, lambda in papers. So I'm gonna demonstrate to you pictorially how this is gonna work. And I'm doing that because in fact, the mathematics are quite complicated and really outside my area of expertise. So if you want the nitty gritty, nitty gritty details, you can follow the link Tom will put into the chat. That'll take you to a 2009 87 page paper. It's authored by Antonin Chambol and his colleagues. So you can take a deeper dive into that mathematics. Uh, good luck with that, that'll be fun. So this, and before we go on to show you a pictorial explanation of this, uh, we're gonna have another polling question. Okay. So this question is related to the uh, total variation filter Angela was just talking about. So this is a true or false uh, question. The statement is, 
Changes in the weighting parameter in total variation smoothing do not affect the pixel intensity histogram. Is it true or false? The answers are coming very fast. It's kind of half and a half. For a second, it was exactly 50 50. <laughs> Got about over 60% voted. I'm gonna give you a few more seconds. And looks like most of you voted. So I'm gonna close the polling. And let's take a look at the results. So it's close, but more people think it's false. And those, that group of the audience would be correct. In fact, the total variation uh, filter does affect the pixel intensity histogram. Okay. So let's look at that and see how it works. So here we're gonna go back to our original uh, image of the foam sample where we wanna apply the total variation Chambol filter. And again, like I mentioned before, we've got two phases here, polymer and air. However, if we look at the histogram, for this image, we see that the pixel intensity of these two phases overlaps. That means that we can't choose a single threshold value to segment this image into polymer and air. If we use the total variation Chambol filter and choose a small value for this weighting factor, we get the following result. And in this case, our weight is 0 0.01, actually that's a typo, sorry about that. And here we can see that the image is in fact denoised and we have two distinct phases in our histogram, so two peaks. So we could easily pick a threshold value and, uh, and select both the polymer or the air. And the thing is, as you increase this weight value, then we clearly retain peaks, but edges get fuzzier and these peaks become broadened. Uh, so that's not really what we want. So the ideal thing to do is to pick a value, the sweet spot that retains the edges, but definitely separates the, the different phases. <clears throat> All right, so that's it for denoising. Uh, in addition to that, we're gonna look at the sharpening filter or unsharpened dragonfly. Just to summarize, uh, I described all this in workshop one. Remember that this filter works by taking the second derivative and then subtracts that from the original image to end up with this one. And the effect is you get much sharper edges or, uh, or for your particular sample. And we're gonna look at that today as well. Um, after that, we're going to look at morphology operations for regions of interest using Dragonfly. So these were covered in the second processing webinar, and they basically work by probing the image with a structuring element, then, then that changes or flips the uh, classification of a given pixel for one phase or another. So this is going to lead us into our next polling question before I show you a couple of examples. Okay. So here is the next question. <clears throat> Which morphological operation will not help to remove holes within the ROIs? So you're choosing the one that does not help to remove holes. Choices are closing, erosion, and dilation. This one is going to have a clear winner, I think. Somebody's been watching the workshop. <laughs> Hopefully. All right, a half of you made your choice. I'm going to give you a few more seconds. There were 20% or so people choosing the other two, but uh, majority is choosing one of the three. So enough of the teasing. So I'm gonna end the polling and share the results. So All erosion right. is the winner. And that's, that's the correct answer. So um, let's just look at those operations. So half of you got that right. And let's see why that's the case. So uh, in this example, 
uh, our structuring element is going to be a circle. And if we perform a dilation, then what's going to happen is the region of interest B will become larger than the original. Uh, additionally, dilation is going to create connections between uh, regions of interest. It's also going to fill holes within the shape. And alternatively, erosion is going to erode uh, the outside edges of this. It's also going to get rid of small islands. Um, and it's also going to create separations between two objects that may be connected by thin lines. And the other two operations, open and close, are just combinations of either dilation and erosion or erosion followed by dilation. So we're going to look at these also in Dragonfly with respect to uh, segmented data. And then lastly, as I mentioned, we're just going to briefly look, take a look at an example of an artifact removal. And we've learned a lot about artifacts in previous uh, webinars and workshops and how these arrive. Some are more common than others, and some can be dealt with more easily than others. And that's going to lead us to the next polling question. This is actually the last on uh, real question. Then okay. comes a fun question. Then, yeah, then comes the fun question. So the question is, which of the following artifacts cannot be corrected using image processing tools? The choices are ring artifacts, aliasing, beam hardening, or none of the above. That's a sad answer. <laughs> the last one. <laughs> I hope that's not that's that's not true, right? A lot of people are choosing it though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, artifacts are hard to deal with. Nobody they're likes hard to it. Deal with. Yeah. No, they're not. <laughs> but you know, they they commonly happen. So they and the do happen. They do. The problem is is that they really mess up some of these tools that do segmentation, they just make it so difficult and you have to do a lot of cleaning up afterwards. If we could get rid of them for segmentation, that'll, that'll help us tremendously. Right. Okay, so it looks like the majority of you um, made your choice. So I'm gonna end the poll and <clears throat> share the results. It's actually pretty split evenly among the four choices, but um, aliasing or none of the above had 30% well, tie. So the people in those two 30% audiences, happy you're right, aliasing is in fact the answer to this question. And I'm going to show you, we're going to describe a couple of these uh, and, and why you can do that or how you can do that. Okay, so the first type that we talked about are ring artifacts. So these are concentric rings uh, in your images and they're usually caused by either a bad pixel or the pixel is, pick, certain pixels are responding non-uniformly to the input uh, radiation or x-rays. So there's a couple of ways you can fix this. One of the ways is with a gain calibration often um, you can fix this that way. Another thing you can do is a mechanical fix. So you move the detector during the data collection and uh, offset it just a tad, and then that gets rid of rings as well. The second type of artifact mentioned was aliasing, and it usually shows up, well, it will show up as radial lines. And this comes from undersampling uh, in data collection. That means you didn't collect a sufficient number of projections. And the only fix to this uh, is to collect more projections. Uh, sometimes you can, you, there are some slight fixes, but really you need to collect more data. And the third type of artifact is streaking and shading. And in fact, beam hardening falls into that classification. You get a lot of that. And these can be a bit trickier to get rid of uh, sometimes you can simply get rid of it by changing the orientation of a sample. Um, in other cases, there are some beam hardening corrections that you can implement. In this particular one, it's very faint, but you'll see some striping uh, or streaking here. We're going to show, I'm going to show you how to correct that in this case uh, with the Dragonfly uh, package.
So, oops, let's go back one. Oh, gave you a peek at the next slide. So the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go into the hands-on portion of the workshop. So I've got to move some things around. Um, all right, so while you're doing that, Angela, we did yeah, have, let's a, take some did have questions. a good question come in and Mike's <laughs> actually, uh, Mike actually jumped on this one. So I'll, I'll write off so everybody knows and uh, um, if Mike cares to comment any further, obviously he can. So Perfect. the question was, does Dragonfly use the same algorithms to perform the same filter morphological operations as ImageJ? Um, and, or does Dragonfly have any proprietary algorithms? So yeah, Mike responded, everything is pretty much standard algorithms. Um, are there, in fact, any proprietary ones, Mike, that uh, you guys work with, or um, you don't want to tell us? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, very rarely do we put anything in uh, in that's uh, proprietary. Uh, that does not mean that uh, we have the same offerings as ImageJ. So what we tend to do as a team is uh, look around the literature and uh, see what, uh, you know, sort of is best in class by the imaging research that's being done by, by academics, and then when available, uh, integrate those algorithms. So, you know, we're, we're doing more of a job of standing on the shoulders of giants and using the work that's come before us and just trying to make the software well-engineered and user-friendly. Uh, we do innovate. But we're not usually trying to innovate by developing pioneer image processing algorithms. We're usually innovating in other ways. So you'll find a lot of functionality that is in ImageJ and in, and in all the competitors. Uh, but most of the time, you'll find that we'll tell you exactly how it behaves and, and refer you to the primary literature if you want to read more about it. So we're, we're often using standard implementations or standard algorithms. Great, great. Thanks, Mike. Mm -hmm. All right, any more questions before we move on and switch gears? No, nope, I think we can okay. head right into the uh, live demo. All right, so then uh, I'm gonna share a different screen here. I'm gonna move you guys around. If you get dizzy, uh, that's why I'm moving you all around. There we go. Okay, <clears throat> so this is a Dragonfly interface. And uh, if you've used Dragonfly and you say, hey, that doesn't look like my Dragonfly, don't be alarmed because uh, this, program allows you to manipulate the interface to dock everything exactly that you use most often. So uh, for example, I can pull things out. If I want to put them in a different location, I can just double click and there they are. They're, they're in a different place. Um, so that's pretty powerful. You can create a custom interface. Um, first thing we're going to do here is we're going to load our uh, foam data set. And this is the same uh, foam data set we've been looking at for quite a while. <clears throat> and then the uh, first thing that we wanna do is, I just wanna show you a few different tools to manipulate things inside the images so we can go across sections to look at different cross sections and others. So this uh, pink line corresponds to this pink box here. Uh, so we can easily dive in. Uh, you can look at 3D rendered volumes. On the left side, I've docked in some window leveling tools. I've also docked in the image processing panel down here. And we're gonna use that today to look at some of these particular tools. Okay, so what first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna zoom in on this. I'm gonna open the image processing tools and we're first gonna pick um, the Gaussian filter. So just click it from the list. One of the things, remember I mentioned that there's a group of categories. So there's a smoothing group. And within that, there'll be a subgroup. So basically a lot of different operations you can perform. So these are all of the ones that are currently there. We're just gonna look at a few of them. So first the Gaussian, uh, and we wanna select our foam original data. And the, what we're gonna do here is we see some options down below. So the first thing uh, you see as an option is what dimension. We're just gonna do this in 2D rather than 3D. Uh, we can select the size of the kernel that we're gonna use and the standard deviation in that case. So if we just pick something like say five and three, uh, then we see some smoothing that's happening here. Um, and if we look at the histogram on the left for the original image, remember it's just a single peak. And on the right, we see some separation. If we start to increase the kernel size, 
uh, then we start to see better separation in this case. So this could indeed be a candidate for you to go on to try some thresholding, cleaning up and then using that perhaps as an input to machine learning or deep learning. So once you've played around with a few of these, then what uh, you can do is you can output a complete data set, all of the slices that have been run through this filter just by clicking simply apply. And it'll show up on the right side in the main view of your available data sets. So, um, so that's, that's what you do. So we've provided you with the sample data and some input files to drag and fly. I suggest you try some of these, output it, and then do some of the things we're gonna show you in a minute. So let's look at um, a, a different type of example for this case. So we talked about Gaussian filters. Um, let's look at the median filter in this case. Uh, and we see here our options again are the kernel size and we can select the uh, shape of the kernel. So is it square, is it circle, or is it a cross? So if I just choose the default square, I see something like this. Now, the one thing you see is some denoising. You also see that we're retaining the edges here. If let's say if we change that to a sphere, it looks about the same, but maybe there's a little difference. As we increase it, then you start to see some uh, bigger effects that are here between these. So this is pretty much gone in some of these cases. And with a square, it's even, it's even worse. So um, you wanna play around with that and you wanna look at different areas within the image so that you make sure that you're making a, an educated choice. What you can also do is you can go to a different slice in the data. So, and just by clicking this, it turns blue up and down and trying it to make sure that it's systematically good throughout all your entire data set. Okay, so the other thing that we wanna look at here is let's say uh, we wanna look at this total variation Chambol filter. Now the options in this case are either your weight and the maximum iteration of your times you're gonna do this. Uh, so I'm just gonna run that. And you'll see it does a really good job just with the default values. So um, in this case, we also have good retention of the edges uh, for our void areas. So if we increase this, let's say to 0 0.5 that I showed you in the slide, it gets kind of fuzzy. And remember, you're always looking at the different histograms for each of these. And uh, it's definitely separated However, the peaks are broader than they would be if we uh, calculated a preview with just using a weighting factor of 0 0.1. So those are the different denoising filters that you can do. If you wanna get it to be a bit more adventuresome and do something like what I showed you in that first workshop, then what you can do is you can select the convolution Remember I told you there is a way to create your own editable matrices or the deconvolution kernel. So in this case, you decide whether you're gonna do this in 2D or 3D and you select the size of the kernel. And if you select anything other than square, like say for example, across, then some of the values in the kernel become zero in that case. So let's pick three so it's easy to see. So you see our corners in this case are zero, so we have a cross. Um, so we could do something like <clears throat> the uh, weighted average filter. So let's say, I'm just gonna pick some values here for a weighted average filter and select a preview. And again, you see, so, so far, it looks to me like the total variation filter is doing better, but if your eyeball is not the perfect test. Um, so you need to, uh, to output data on each of these steps and, uh, and look at results. Now, one of the other things that's extremely powerful about Dragonfly is that it's really easy to set up sequential operations. So let's say, for example, that I wanted to run a Gaussian filter and uh, then perhaps, so I look at this and I go, well, I'd like a little sharpening 
of the edges in this case. Um, so how about if I added an unsharp to go with it? Then I can complex, uh, I can compute a preview where it sequentially runs both of these and shows me what the output would be for this single area that's uh, shown on the left panel here. This takes a little bit longer, um, but it's really nice for you to try a few things in combination before you try applying it to a full uh, set of uh, image stack. So this is the result that we get. So if we look at the histogram of each of these, then we could make an educated guess um, that uh, perhaps this might be a good candidate to go on to investigate using uh, thresholding in fact. So if you were using these combined operations, you have the option of outputting the Gaussian as well as the Gaussian unsharped data or just the Gaussian unsharped. So you can just delete one of these if you don't wanna have both of those image stacks already in there. Okay, so then that's kind of a simple way to show you some of the uh, image processing filters unless uh, uh, Mike wants to throw something else in that I might not have shown him that it's worthy of uh, some attention. No, nothing, nothing to single out. Okay, all right. All right. So before we uh, before you jump on to the next step, we've had a couple of questions come in. Looks like one we had answered. Uh, yeah, again, Mike Mike got to it before we, <laughs> is um, asking about Excellent. segmentation and uh, and deep learning. Is do you use the the raw images and not the filtered? And so, uh, actually, Mike gave a very good, uh, very good comment here that uh, there's no consensus yet. Uh, um, but in many cases, you do just use your raw, unfiltered images. Um, so I want to make sure we got through that. And then we had a couple other questions to me real quick. And so, uh, the first one, Mike, Mike is you want to go ahead and answer that out loud, Mike, with this um, the uh, other types of optical images. Oh, sure. Yeah, uh, the, the question says, I assume that we can use other types of optical images, not just x-ray images, right? Is there any compatibility issue? So uh, as far as Dragonfly is concerned, uh, one image is just a set of pixels and any image from any other instrument is just a set of pixels. Uh, and people do use Dragonfly for processing uh, SEM images and TEM images, and of course, x-ray images, whether it's x-ray CT or digital radiography. You can use optical images collected off uh, a confocal microscope where you might be looking at particular fluorescent signals where you may, in, uh, you may import multiple signals. You can also do bright field microscopy, that form of optical images. I would just caution you in that the Dragonfly uh, the version that we're on now, this is not something we've added. We have not added anything that uh, treats the different channels of an optical image uh, in a convenient way. So it turns out that when you use a bright field optical microscope, you actually get a red channel, a green channel, and a blue channel. And Dragonfly will let you import those images, um, but they don't display in a natural color way. So you, you may have some uh, workflow issues with, with color bright field images. But uh, yes, pretty much any sort of image that you, you can think of, there's probably a file reader already there. If not, contact us and we'll figure out what the gap is. Sorry for the long answer, Tom. Uh, no problem. That's, uh, that's why right. you're that's here right. <laughs> you know, to elaborate for us. One of the things I did mention that I'll point out, let's say that you get a particular blend of filters that you like a lot and you wanna use it repeatedly without having to go into the image processing panel, you can save those operations as a step. And they show up in, if I close this, then they'll show up uh, in the image processing panel as some uh, operations that you have. Right now, we don't have any saved, um, but that might be some, some way that you could repeatedly perform the same procedure over and over again um, for, for different image sets. Okay, so one of the things I wanted to quickly show you before uh, we go on here is, um, uh, let's see, is this where we wanna do this? Or the next one, let's see where we at time. Let's do it here. So. Let's say, for example, we want we output data sets from each of these denoising filters, and we want to compare what some simple thresholding results 
uh, will give us. So let's say, for example, uh, I like this, but I want to see three at the same time. So this one now, it, because there's an I here and the I is not crossed out, so basically it can we see the foam. We can click in the middle and say, so we want to compare our original foam data to our output from the Gaussian. And perhaps we also want to look at this, um, this, how about the total variation Chambol filter. And you'll see that they're not really synced right now, but that's easy to fix. So if I just click on the first one and say, sync everything to this left side panel, and then I make the manipulations in here, then we can quickly navigate and we get a side-by-side -side view where everything is synchronized in terms of the zoom, the position, as, as well as um, the, the, the histogram leveling, the window leveling that we're doing rather. So uh, then I can do a couple of things. So on this uh, main tab, these are the things for visualization tools. There are also, there's also a tab for segmentation. And this, these again are a bunch of docked tools that we can use. Um, we can simply use Otsu thresholding. So if I go click on this left panel, you see it's, in, it's uh, outlined in red and say define range in upper Otsu, this is the result that I would get. Um, so for example, you see here that no matter what thresholding value I pick, I can't get a clean result that separates polymer and foam. Um, I can do the same for, uh, let's see, uh, let me just leave that on. I can do the same for the middle um, and do an upper Otsu. And we see that's actually pretty clean here. Um, the thing I notice is that it's missing some outside edges here that I might want to refine just a bit. However, if I uh, decrease this value, then I start to pick up some stuff inside the void. So I'm just going to go with the default. And if we look at the results of simple thresholding with the total variation filter, it does a much cleaner job. And one of the things I want you to notice is that in this case, it's really helping us to retain these very thin sections of polymer between the voids. Whereas if we filter, we use a different filter and then do the thresholding, we lose those. So we're gonna have to fix that in some way. So if you were thinking about this and you use this to create a region of interest and now I'm going to paint some things away, you want to think about what's going to require the least amount of time to fix. Um, what's going to make this experiment faster? So if you made an eyeball comparison, then my choice might be to use a total variation as my starting point. So just a quick and easy tool that shows you Dragonfly makes it easy to compare these different things. So now what I want to do is switch gears and look at uh, some morphological operations. And just to make things more interesting, we're going to load a different data set. So in this case, we're going to use Sandpack here. Yeah, do you want to clear it? I absolutely do. And I want to load the next one. And again, I have my sand data and my sand pack here. Um, you'll see this data is, is quite noisy, right? So uh, what we want to do here is to segment them and try to clean them up. We're going to do the exact same thing. And I'm doing this twice. So you'll remember uh, there, whenever you go through the ebook later, perhaps, then you'll remember uh, seeing this twice. So I'm going to click on the bottom, get that view. I'm going to go uh, back to the main tab. And what I want to do here is this teeny tiny scroll bar is say, I want to see three side by side. This is my original data. Click on the middle, make this our Gaussian one. Click on the right side, maybe make that our median one. And uh, click back on the left because it's going to be our parent uh, to which all the other children views are going to uh, correspond there or synchronized to the zoom and position. Uh, all right, uh, then what we can do here is a uh, little teeny scroll bar. Uh, I have the, uh, Mike, I have the font size really um, big, so it's kind of messing up everything. So you'll notice I use this little square here to zoom in on an area and it automatically adjusts the, 
the contrast for uh, the for that area that I selected. So you can quickly uh, get everything uh, the contrast pretty decent to look at. All right. So the first thing I want to do is we're going to repeat some things that we did before. So uh, I'm going to click on the left one, define range. And just as an upper Otsu, and I see I've got lots of holes in here. Um, and I'm just gonna pick a, a value I think might look good. And then I, if I wanted to save that segmentation, it's really easy. You just say add to new. And you'll see over here in the data properties area, I have a new region of interest. I'll just say that, I'll just call that sand original ROI. And I'm gonna turn that off. Then I'm gonna click on the middle one and do it again, upper Otsu. That looks pretty good. Uh, but I notice here in between some of these, these sand grains are connected when they really shouldn't be. I could tweak this a little bit, but uh, then I create holes. So I'm just gonna stay with the default uh, upper Otsu, click to new. I'm gonna call this uh, sand gauss. ROI and turn off the define range, then click on the right side, define range, upper oat soup. I see some holes here too. But what I notice is that for the uh, median data set, um, there's a clean gap between the two grains on the side. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm happy with that. So I'm gonna say, uh, call this sand. Median. ROI and enter and stop that. So then I'm going to do some, I'm going to select one of these and I'm going to perform some sort of morphological operation. So I'm looking to see which one is easiest to perhaps clean up. And this is uh, pretty faint. So let's give it a different color. That's really easy to do. Um, say for, for example, I'm going to do this uh, bright. How about this blue color? Oh, that's a little better, okay? So the morphological operations uh, in Dragonfly are located, uh, in my case, still within the segmenting tab. So you'll see just below all of the ROI tools, there are morphological operations. And in this case, remember, um, dilate is just gonna make things bigger. If I follow it um, by an erosion, then that's a close operation. If I try that, then I see um, I, I'm, making, uh, I'm making a mess of things. It's not really helping me at all. Uh, if I don't like it, I can undo it and then you choose a different step. If I say open and see how that does, it's even worse. So um, it's not a lost cause, but it means that I probably have to do more painting than anything um, if I choose this to move forward with. Let's go to the uh, sand Gaussian. So I'll click on the middle and click on that data set because I want to perform operations on that data set. Uh, and then it looks really, really good. Uh, there aren't a lot of holes in there, but remember we lose some of the, uh, we gain, we, we have connections between things that we don't want. So let's try an open operation for those and uh, see what happens. Not much going on here. I can increase this kernel size a bit see if I get a little bit more. And I'm not, I'm not really breaking the connection between these. One of the points also I wanna make is that as I'm doing this, it's, it's doing it really quickly. It's not only performing the operation on what I'm looking at, it's performing it on the whole, in the region of interest through the whole stack of images. Uh, and you see it's pretty much instantaneous. So that kernel size was drastic and really didn't help me much at all. So it's good, but I might have to do some painting. What happens if I go to the one on the right, the median? I click, it's got a red box around it, click the region of interest in the list of proper data properties. And let's try a close on this. That was horrible. Now I'm gonna undo it because likely it, I just have a, my kernels too big. We'll see what happens. That did a pretty good job, but now I've got these, um, these connections or bridges between here. So I'm gonna undo that. Now you can do a fill uh, inner area 
and uh, try that. That's like a fill holes operation that we've showed you in uh, image J. So it's very similar to that. And it did a good job while retaining the edges, but it still made some connections. Um, but, but you see, you get an idea. So I would recommend that you take some of these data, create some output and play around with them quite a bit. There's also an extra data set for a rock core in there that you can uh, try as well. Anything else you suggest, Mike? And also I'd, I'd be curious um, to have I and Mike tell me, what are your favorite filters and what would be your go-to next step? Uh, well, so, well, it's a, a, a big question, I guess. Um, <laughs> the part of, a part of becoming the, the image processing guru or master or whatever word you want to use is just becoming acquainted with the tools so that when you have a data set in front of you, you can start to recognize, oh, now I know which tool I want to reach for because I, I, I know what's in the toolbox. So, um, the median filter is uh, is a very good filter for a lot of uh, cases of noise, and it can be slow if you use a big kernel, but you can see here what good results uh, it's giving you. And so I would probably go down the, the same solution. Um, uh, by and large, um, most of the time when I'm doing image processing these days, I'm, I'm no longer working on uh, good data. I'm always working on people's challenging data that they're putting in front of me. And so... I kind of just leave all my uh, image filters behind and go directly to, to deep learning for those demanding problems. So I think I'm actually getting out of practice with, with which filters to use because I just have one magic key. But um, when you don't want to use the deep learning because it's going to take you too much time, just having some familiarity with the right filters. But you've shown a, a great job of what the median filter does here. Excellent. I think my new, my new favorite is a total variation filter. But that's tricky because these are easy examples, right, Mike? They are only two phases. It gets a bit trickier when you get multiple multiple phases, um, more than two. So um, well, for, I, for sure. I like what you've done here in uh, drawing everyone's attention to the histogram uh, and saying, let's monitor the histogram, the image before uh, processing and after processing. Um, I, I once described this in a talk as uh, chasing deltas. So if you, uh, you may have covered in, in a mathematics course or an image processing course, the delta function is just a, a you know, the axis is, is zero everywhere. And then you have a single, a single peak where all the values are in one peak. And that's ultimately what would give you a perfect image and a perfect segmentation. So you see that you end up maybe with two broad peaks that are both on top of each other, like we saw in the foam case. And as Angela succeeded to use filters to push the bright pixels into uh, a bright peak and the dark pixels into a dark peak, you ended up resolving those. The, the infinite extension of that is not only would you resolve them, but you would make the peaks narrower and narrower and you'd have two delta functions. Or in the case of three or four or five different phases, you would have five different delta functions. So uh, as, as Angela points out, the processing that you're doing, it's gonna be more demanding with more phases, but keep doing what she's doing and paying attention to the histogram and you'll start to see, oh, these phases are becoming resolved. That's really what you're trying to do is resolve the brightness, resolve the effectively achieve contrast between one phase and another. Definitely. And you know, this, is usually, I, I usually always try machine learning or deep learning versus just straight segmentation. But to do that, you need a ground truth data set. So you pick a few slices and that's your data set. And that's what this is gonna input. You're, but you wanna paint as little as possible. You wanna try to cleanly do this. Uh, one of the last things I wanna show you is that if you get a clean uh, thresholding or segmentation, then for example, you don't like some sections, it's really easy to fix it in Dragonfly. So just below um, these operations I just showed you is the region of interest painter, ROI painter. So I can easily uh, add some red or delete some red from this right panel. So there are some paint brushes around one and a square one. Uh, so, and I can adjust its size. So if I wanted to make this broader, it's easy to do that. If I can delete it, if I make a mistake and, and then it's, it's automatically updating the region of interest in the data properties window. So you can quickly get 
to a ground truth data set to move on to the next step. And uh, uh, just, just powerful stuff. Uh, some other really cool tools I use with the recent data set are some of these uh, draw lines. So for example, um, if I have a polygon, then I could select a whole polygon really easily and fill in areas. And I use that a lot for one particular data set that gave me a lot of problems. So really good stuff here. All right, so with that, I have one last example. It's not gonna take that long. I wanna show you, but I promise you I would. It's this Didim data set that's here. We're gonna load it. And here it is. It's a beautiful data set. It was collected by our colleagues in, uh, in Rigaku, Japan. And I think that, uh, Mike, you've used this for uh, some of your, um, maybe a Dragonfly daily ones for showing deep learning. So mm -hmm. I'm gonna click on this, yeah. And Seth's got some small fibers and some large fibers in this denim. But one of the things I want you to notice are these stripes. So if I wanted to get rid of those, I could try this de-striping uh, feature that's in Dragonfly uh, just down here. So image processing panel advanced. And I'm gonna to go to artifact removal, vertical de-striping. And I'm just gonna zoom in here so we can see it really well. The, the default stuff, compute preview, and it's they're gone. Um, if they're horizontal, there's a horizontal de-striping. There's also arbitrary if they were at some angle at some point. Uh, so this might be, this might remove some of these things that might confuse a deep learning algorithm if this uses this as input, um, and for example, and I've done that before as well. Uh, there's also, I didn't have time to touch on it. There's some denoising with noise to noise um, I, that uh, Mike has mentioned in his Dragonfly Daily and I think us in one of our, our webinars. Anything else, Mike, that you'd like them to know about? Uh, sure, the, the noise to noise was described uh, maybe four, four or five years ago. And then more recently, about two and a half or three years ago, there was a, another version called the noise to void, uh, which is a, uh, it's effectively another uh, denoising deep learning algorithm that is unsupervised. You don't have to create any ground truth. Uh, so it's yes. uh, quite popular. Right. In, your input is your output. Your output's your input. It's kind of cool. Anyway, uh, that, that's kind of silly. But so we're going to, we're running out of time. So we're going to wrap up. I'm going to do a little bit of uh, shuffling here to do new share. Back to screen one. And I'm going to go here and just wrap things up. So the things we covered here, we looked at why do we do it? What tools do we have available? And we looked at some examples. And now comes the fun uh, poll, right? So yes. I'm going to hand this over to, to, um, to Tom and Aya. All right. So uh, as you guys have known for the past year, we've got a uh, just a single die. I painted the... Uh, the number or the dots so that it's a little easier to tell what I rolled. Um, please go ahead and enter. There's 42 of you. So I want to see 42 entries this time and be sure to break the Gaussian curve because this is one through six again. And we always have a peak up four. Four. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's so weird. Even if we shuffle. See, now that we said that though, now we Probably said that we don't have a four people. when we're telling everybody not to pick four. So again, this die is not loaded. Not, it is just a piece yeah, of Tom, wood that I am dropping on my desk. Do not roll a four then. Yeah, you, you can't get That's what I'm saying. Is a, <laughs> but you told them not to pick four. That's yeah. right. That's right. So everybody pick what you want. I'm going to give you a few more seconds. Yeah. Yeah. See if we can get up to 80% participating here. A few more percents. Are you still awake? <laughs> yeah, no, so. it looks like uh, it doesn't seem to be changing. So let's say go ahead. Okay, and so I'm it. gonna close it in three, two, one. All right. Okay. So actually, we, we, got a good we broke the peak. Today. The Gaussian. Oh, peak. look at there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So all right. So here we're gonna drop it on my desk, and wouldn't you know it? No oh, way. You got four. <laughs> no way. I feel terrible. I feel terrible. But you know, Goodness. three is oh, also no. part of that Gaussian curve. So yeah. But well, if you selected four, you're not sure a winner. And I said there are 
actually more than before, there are quite a few of you. Uh, we will send you an email with a e gift card for $30. Congratulations. Yes, congratulations. <laughs> All right. And with that, uh, we'll just go on and have a Q&A. Not much time, though. Yeah, so we actually, we don't have time for the Q&A. Mike answered a quick question. Um, actually, this is kind of uh, for, for us going forward. Is, uh, is it possible to demonstrate an effective example with three phases? So, um, uh, or a more challenging example. So that's something that we can hopefully weave into a, a future session. Yeah. Um, One of the things so I'll mention is that I gave you a test data that has three phases. So you might play around with that. So it's there you sample go. data. Very good, there you go. That's your homework. So you, you can send Angela your answers. She is uh, happy to look at them and check, check your data. Absolutely. All right. So with that, we'll just yes. press on. All right. So uh, as I said earlier, a recording of the webinar will be available tomorrow. And the email will go out to all the registrants with instructions on how to view that recorded presentation. Uh, links to the resources mentioned today will also be shared on the landing page. Uh, I want to mention, uh, since we didn't get to it, um, you know, if you like what you're seeing, please subscribe. Uh, I'm going to put a link into the uh, into the um, chat. into the chat so that you can see our our, uh, our pages and also a link to our future workshop. So there's that. And then uh, we will be starting a three episode deep dive series on digital rock analysis uh, starting on Wednesday, July the 11th at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. Now, please note that all three sessions tie together, so please try to attend all of them. And we look forward to seeing all of you then. Thanks for joining us, and we'll talk to you again in July. Thank Bye you all everyone. now. Bye, everyone. Thanks for Thank coming. You. Bye. Bye.